here is what happened. Dionysius continued to stay on his estate. He found various excuses, but the truth was that he was neither able to separate himself from Calerho, nor willing to take her back with him. Because when people saw her, they would all talk about her, her beauty would enslave the whole of Ionia, and report of her would reach the great king himself. While living there, he examined the affairs of the estate in detail, and he had occasion to criticize the work of his steward's focus. His criticism did not go beyond words, but Plajon saw her chance. She ran to Calerho with an air of panic, tearing her hair, and grasped her knees. My lady, she cried, please save us. Dionysius is angry with my husband, and he's just as severe, as severe a man when he's angry as he is kind. You're the only person who can save us. Dionysius will gladly grant you the first favor you've asked for. Now, Kellerho was reluctant to go to him, but when Plajon begged and pleaded with her, she could not refuse because she was under obligation to her for her services. So, as not to appear ungrateful, then, she said, I am a slave too, you know, and have no right to speak. But if you think my voice will carry any weight, I will add my appeal to yours. I hope we succeed. When they arrived, Planjon told the shopkeeper to tell his master that Calerho was there. At that moment, Dionysius was prostrate with grief. His very body had wasted. When he heard Calerho was there, he felt faint, and a mist came over him at the unexpected news. He managed to recover. Tell her to come in, he said. Calerho came in, came and stood by him, her head bowed. At first she blushed deeply, then she managed to find her voice. I am grateful to Plajon here, she said. She loves me like a daughter. Master, I ask you not to be angry with her husband. Let him off as a favor to me. She tried to say more, but was unable to. Dionysius saw what Planjon's scheme was. Yes, I am angry, he said, and no one would have saved Focus and Planjon from death for what they have done, but I gladly spare them as a favor to you. You too must realize that it is to Calerho you owe your lives. Planjon fell at his feet. It is Calerho's feet you should fall at, said Dionysius. She is the one who has saved you. Planjon saw that Calerho was pleased and delighted by the favor. You must thank Dionysius for us then, she said, and pushed her forward. Calerho stumbled a little and clutched at Dionysius' right hand. As if declining to give her his hand, he drew it to him, and then he kissed her. And then he let go of her immediately so that she would not suspect he had done it deliberately. Well, the woman went off, but the kiss penetrated Dionysus' heart like poison. He could not see, he could not hear. He had ta been taken by storm, heart and soul. He could find no remedy for his passion. Gifts would not serve, for he could see that she was proud, nor threats of force, for he was convinced that she would prefer death to violence. His one resource was Planjon, he thought, so he sent for her. You have begun the campaign, he said, and I thank you for the kiss but it has either saved me or ruined me. So try to overcome her as a woman with woman. You have me on your side. I will tell you that the prize awaiting you is your freedom, and something much sweeter to you than freedom, I am sure, Dionysius's life. With this instruction before her, Planjon brought all her experience and skill to bear, but on all sides, Calerho proved invincible. She stayed true to Charius alone. Fortune outwitted her, though. Fortune, against whom alone human calculation has no power. For fortune relishes victory, 
and anything may be expected of her. So now she brought about an unexpected, indeed incredible state of things. How she did it is worth hearing. Fortune laid her plot against Callerho's loyalty to her husband. After Charius and Callerho were married, their first contact was passionate. They had an equal impulse to enjoy each other, and matching desire had made their union faith fruitful. So just before her fall, Callerho became pregnant. But thanks to subsequent dangers and hardships, she did not realize her condition straight away. But at the beginning of the third month, her belly began to grow big. Planjun, with her woman's experience, noticed it at the bath. At the time, she said nothing, since there was a lot of servant women there. But in the evening, when she got the chance, she sat beside Callerho on the couch and said, You should know you are pregnant, my child. Callerho cried aloud, groaned, and tore her hair. Fortune, you have added this as well to my misfortunes, that I should become a mother too, mother of a slave. She struck her belly. Poor creature, she cried. Even before birth, you have been buried and handed over to pirates. What sort of a life are you coming to? What, with what hopes shall I give birth to you, without father or country a slave? Taste death before you are born. Planjon restrained her hands with a promise that the next day she would find her an easier way to procure a miscarriage. Left alone, each of the women followed her own line of reasoning. Planjon thought, here is the chance to satisfy your master's passion. Callerho's condition will help your cause. You have found a sure way of convincing her. Her maternal instincts will be stronger than her loyalty to her husband, and she planned a convincing course of action. Callerho, however, planned to destroy the child. Am I, she said to herself, to bring Hippocrates' descendant into the world to serve a master? Am I to bear a child whose father no one knows? Perhaps some envious person will say, Callerho became pregnant among the pirates. It is enough for me alone to suffer misfortune. It is not in your interest to come into a life of misery, my child, a life you should escape from even if you are born. Depart in freedom while no harm has befallen you without hearing what they say about your mother. And then again she changed her mind, and pity came over her for her unborn child. Are you planning to kill your child? Was ever woman so wicked? Are you mad? Are you reasoning like Medea? Why, people will think you are yet more savage than that Scythian woman. At, she, at any rate, did hate her husband. But you want to kill Charia's child and not even leave behind any memorial of that celebrated marriage. What if it is a son? What if he is like his father? What if he is luckier than me? He has escaped from the tomb, from the pirates. Shall his mother kill him? How many stories are there of sons of gods and kings born in slavery than coming to their rightful ancestral rank? Zethus, Amphion, Cyrus, you too, my child. You will sail to Sicily, I am sure. You will go and find your father and your grandfather and tell them your mother's story. A fleet will sail from Sicily to rescue me. Oh, my child, you will restore your parents to each other. All night long she pursued these thoughts. And as she did so, sleep stole over her momentarily, and a vision of Charius stood over her, like him in every way, like to him in stature and fair looks and voice and wearing just such clothes. As he stood there, he said, I entrust our son to you, my wife. He wanted to say yet more, but Callerho jumped up and tried to embrace him. So on her husband's advice, as she thought, she decided to rear her child.